good morning. And I don't care if news rang, it's good morning, because it's the day of the Lord. But a couple, another couple more announcements that I didn't do beforehand. Uh, John's had heart failure. John. And he's still got fluid, and it's being removed through medical medicine that he's taken. And that will get progressively better, and he should be able to live with it, have a more comfortable situation. Also, my brother Mike went through the coronavirus protocol and he showed absolutely no symptoms and he was released from protocol yesterday. Uh, I'm imagining in my mind that it was probably a false, false positive because he has a lot of medical problems and uh, although he has type O blood, he still has other medical problems that would cause him to have, have that. He's had five bypass surgeries and several things. We're going to talk about the Lord's table this morning, the Lord's Supper. I thought about this lesson for a while and, and I, I kept putting it off and putting it off and uh, appropriate time and I just felt now was an appropriate time we could work on that. There is a possibility that we can take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Our goal is to take it in a worthy manner. We want to... It's important that we do. Uh, it's of utmost importance that we do. Importance that we do. And there's a lot of ways we could take it in an unworthy manner. But I'm not going to go into that. I'm going to go into what it is that we have to do to have to take it in a worthy manner because we want to make sure where, where we need to be. I want to look at a couple of scriptures that, that Paul writes in 1 Corinthians to start with to, to, to kind of introduce what he's saying here. Like I said, we could take communion in a way that it would be idolatry. I showed Shelby a picture this morning that showed a nun and she had one of these crucifixions with Jesus on it, the cross with Jesus on it, and it's laying on a table and she's laying down kissing its feet. That's idolatry. Idolatry in its greatest form. And we want to try our best to stay out of that type of situation. So let's look at a few scriptures here to try to help us to, to see the point that I'm trying to make. We need to find meaning in the Lord's Supper. Why are we doing it? How can we do it in a worthy manner that would be more satisfactory to God? Look at what Paul wrote here. He said, Wherefore, my beloved, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Well, you say, well, what's that got to do with communion? Well, listen to what he says. I speak as a wise, I speak as to the wise, judge you, judge you what I say. The cup of the blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of our Lord, of, of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of one bread. He said that when we partake of this, what we're partaking of is the body of Jesus Christ. He don't mean it trans, trans, changes into the body, but it represents the body. And when we take that fruit of the vine, it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And we do it as one. Now that's the first thing that we have to be able to do. We have to be able to do that as one. Because if we're taking it, now don't get me wrong, every one of us are individuals and we take it individually. And we should, when it says to, to, to evaluate yourself, you shouldn't be concerned about anybody else partaking of the community. It should be within you and you and God and that's it. We shouldn't be sitting there thinking, well, you know, He's just come to church once in the last six months. What's he doing taking communion? That's between him and God. That has nothing to do with us, each of us. We should all be taking it as one for the same purpose. But I want you to look what he says now when he goes on down to begin at verse 18. You know, he says what we should be doing, but look at the statement he made to start with. Whore for my beloved, my, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. This idolatry has something to do with what he's talking about. Now let's look at let's look at verse 18. Behold Israel after the flesh. That's not the communion, that's after the flesh. Are not they which eat the sacrifice partakers of the altar? Now 
think of what he's saying. When they partook of the meat of the altar, and that was the, the Levitical priesthood, were they not participating with the altar? Absolutely. They were a part of that. Read on, verse 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered to the sacrifice to the idol is anything? But I say, I say that, that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should be have fellowship with the devils. So if you're sacrificing that to the devil, then you're having fellowship with the devil. If you're doing it to the altar, then you're having fellowship to the altar. Now listen to what it says. Verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of the devil. Do we prove, do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Or are we stronger than that? He's comparing taking the Lord's Supper in a wrong way. Then we're doing it in a way that's not worthy. We're doing it in an unworthy way. Paul's contrasting this idolatry that took place with the Gentiles and, and sort of with the, what, the, what the Jewish people had made it. They had made it like idolatry. And he's contrasting that there with partaking of the Lord's table, Lord's Supper. So we're partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're partaking with each other, but we're partaking of it with Jesus Christ too. Because he says, I'll be there with you. To partake of the Lord's Supper is to participate in Christ. And to participate in Christ is totally inconsistent with, with any type of idol worship. They can't coexist together. Think about it. Idols can idols talk. Idols are mute. Idols are powerless. They're dead. But Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus is powerful. He's vocal through His Word. So the question comes down to it. How can we find meaning in the Lord's Supper to be worthy of taking in the Lord's Supper? Oh, it's easy. Very easy to just partake of the Lord's Supper. Take the bread, take the fruit of the vine, and just let our minds wander. I know it's hard to concentrate sometimes, but, but that this is a time and period, and it's not that long that we should really be able to concentrate. I read a scripture, I read a, an article that one guy wrote, he said, Well, the communion has nothing to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I said, what's it have to do with that? It says, in remembrance of me. What are we to remember? From the creation forward. We're supposed to do everything according to Him. And the death, burial, and resurrection is there. We've got to look inward to ourselves. We've got to look upward to God. If we just let our mind wander, is that what Jesus would want? Is that what we want? Jesus said in Mark 14, 38, he said, watch ye, there, watch ye and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready. But the flesh is weak. We know that communion has to be partaken in, a, in the manner in which it says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. The truth is easy. We do that. But the spirit, the mind that we have when we're doing this is what's so important. We can only find meaning in the Lord's Supper when we remember Jesus. We build monuments all the time, don't we? We got monuments to our veterans. There's one down here in Greenham County, I think, is a, is a great monument. I, I like that. We've stopped there several times. <coughs> Why do we do that? Because we want to remember those who have made sacrifice for us. And many have sacrificed their lives their bodies. It's appropriate to take time to reflect, to think about what they gave up, what they did, so that we could be free of this we are. Well, I venture to put forth that the Lord's Supper is a living memorial to Jesus Christ. Think about what it says. 
Luke chapter 22, verse 19 through 20, and it said that he took bread, and he, and he broke it. And he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he said, uh, he took the cup uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Do you realize he says here that he gave up his body for us? That he shed his blood for us? And we're told to do this in his remembrance. So we need to reflect on some things. When we're doing this in his remembrance, we need to reflect on things. Uh, just like the, the if, if you go to a, 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 the war memorials, any of them, the Vietnam War Memorial, any of them, then you reflect on what went on in the Vietnam War. To go to Washington, D.C. and walk along that wall of the, of the Vietnam War Memorial, it's breathtaking. I don't know if any, have any, have any, have any of you been there. You start up here at the beginning of the war, and as you walk, you go down, and the number of the names go up until you come out the other end. And it's just, it, it's kind of breathtaking almost as you walk through it. it. It's a fantastic thing. But we need to, and we reflect on a lot of things during that, for that period of time. But what we need to do is to reflect on Jesus. When we're partaking of this Lord's table, we need to think about Jesus. We need to think back. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Who was Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ was the Son of God. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's who Jesus is. He's not just someone that walked upon the face of the earth. He's not someone that just sacrificed His life. He is God who sacrificed His life, His physical life. He's also the Word. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. He's the Word of God that became flesh and come and, and showed us what we needed to do to please God. John 1, 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as, as the only begotten Son of the Father, only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We need to reflect on that. We need, when we're sitting here partaking of the communion of the Lord's Supper, we need to think about that. Who he was and what he did. And what he did we need to reflect because in 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 22 who did not sin, did no sin neither was God found in his mouth. Can you imagine being a human on this earth and not committing sin? We can't do that. As pure humans we can't do that. But Jesus did. He lived in the flesh and he went about and associated with the world, but he never committed sin. That's the only way he could be the, the eternal sacrifice of the Lamb without spot or blemish. Luke 24 and 20. And how the chief priests and our rulers del uh, delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. He died a cruel death. He died a humiliating death. Here we have God himself and many people slapping him in the face. People spitting upon him. People making fun of him. People uh, putting a crown of thorns on his head, stripping his clothing off of him. And then nailing him to a cross. He died a cruel, humiliating death. Why? Here's an important story. He died for others, not for himself. He died for others. He died for people who didn't deserve this. None of us deserve it, of course. But what I'm saying is, he died a death, and, and, and the death was totally for other people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 through 4. He said, For I delivered unto you first that also which I, all, all, all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And then he was buried and then he arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He died for us. He died so that we didn't have to die that eternal separation from God, that spiritual death that was coming. So we need to think about this. We need to remember 
His death on the cross. It's hard to visualize things like that because we were not there, but you can think about what it would be like. Not only the death on the cross, but the crown of thorns. That crown of thorns being stuffed down on his head, probably digging into the scalp, into the sides of his head. And of course, the brutal beating of those slashes on his back. And then he was taken and laid his hands willingly down for someone to nail him to the cross. Next time we'll take a communion, remember what Jesus went through. Again, we'll never find meaning to the Lord's Supper until we connect with Jesus. You know, if you're not connected with Jesus, you, 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 know, you have absolutely no right to partake of the communion of our Lord's Supper. You have to be in Jesus. How do you get in Jesus? You come in contact with His blood. You can only come in contact with His blood through baptism for the remission of your sins. Now, I'm not saying baptism is all that saves you. We could, we could stand up here probably and talk for an hour about what saves us. And not talk about it, just mention the words grace, faith, baptism, hope. Just on and on. We could go on and on words that tell us what, what it means. Think about what we do. We've not been doing it a lot lately because of the coronavirus, but we have meals with our family, sometimes family gatherings. And when that family gathers together, they sit down around the table. Pack food from each other. Eat and drink together. And then we visit. We show our love and loyalty when we do family business. And we have a connection, a common identity with us. Maybe it might be our life's name, it's just the fact that we're all related together. The Lord's Church is the greatest family on earth. Have the greatest relationship on earth. There's more members in the, in the Lord's family than there is any other family on the face of this earth, except the human family. We connect with Jesus Christ when we come to the Lord's table. That's a connection. And we can only do that connection though if we're members of the body of Christ. He joins us at this table. When we come together to have the Lord's table, Jesus Christ is here with us partaking of this. Listen to what he said. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, you could not drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devil. You could not partake of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. So whose table is it? It's the Lord's table. When we sit down there, we're sitting down there with the Lord. When we sit here and partake of the communion of our Lord's Supper, we're participating with the Lord. It's not something to just casually do like it's just any other meal. As a matter of fact, that's what the first Christ, what they were doing in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. They were do, doing it like a common meal. He eats and drinks the same as we do. Although his is more spiritual than ours is. Look what he says. Look at chapter 22 and verse 16. He said, For I say unto you, I will not, uh, I will not anymore eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Or the kingdom of God. So when we gather together to partake of the communion of the Lord's Supper, Jesus Christ is there. He's participating with us. If we can't connect with Jesus Christ, then we're not doing it in a worthy manner. And we get that connection here. When we get that connection, we identify with Him. We identify with His life, with His teaching. We identify with everything about Jesus Christ. Look what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 9. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that He was rich, yet for your sake He became poor, yet through His poverty might be rich. That's the teaching of Jesus Christ. We connect with Him there. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. We connect with Jesus Christ's teaching, 
And in order to do that, we have to study to show ourselves approved. We have to look into the Word of God and gain the information that's there. We should want to follow Him. Think of His generosity. Think of what He's gave us. Think of the love of Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing, and the, the, the love of God, both of them, and, and it's fantastic. It's one thing for Jesus Christ to decide to lay down His life for us. But think of the Father laying down His Son's life. That's deep. That gets right down to who we are. How many of us would have sent our children willingly to Vietnam to die for other people? We wouldn't do that. We're not going to do that willingly. Send our children. We'll say, I'll go, but let my child stay here. God did. God said, I'll send my son to do that. God, Jesus done it willingly. And God sent him there. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 through 17. He said, the cup of the blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? I know I've used this scripture, but listen. It's all in one. The bread which we break. Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we through many are one bread and one body. And Jesus Christ is that body. The church is part of Him. He's the head of that body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Did you connect with Jesus this morning? Let's pray we did. Let's pray we were in the right mind and the right thought. And as we, as, as we remember Jesus, then we connect with Jesus. Then we're here we're with Him and He's here with us. It's so important that we understand what the communion is all about. We can only find true meaning with Jesus Christ through being thankful to Jesus. We write cards. Let me take that back. I'm not ready for that. We write thinking cards, don't we? We do a lot of times. We're thinking of you cards and we usually, if someone sends us a gift, a wedding gift, a birthday gift, we don't thank them for that gift. When someone does something special for us, a service for us maybe, maybe they come and do something for our home that we can't do ourselves and, and we're very grateful for that, so we send them a thank you card. We need to remember to thank God for the blood of Jesus. We need to remember to thank God for the body of Jesus Christ. We've done that this morning. If we're not willing to be thankful for God for what He's given us when we take, partake of the communion of our Lord's Supper, we ask a blessing, as John did, on both the bread and the fruit of the mind. You know, the scriptures which John read are, are there for a purpose. You wouldn't have to read those scriptures. If we could all get our minds in the right frame of mind, and that's what the purpose of the scriptures is, is to help us get our minds in the right frame. Now, we should have already been working on that. You know, uh, I've, I've known people in Rich, I don't think they ever said it, and if he did, I'm sorry, Richard. But I've had people, I've heard people say, let's sing a song to prepare us for the Lord's Supper. You should have been preparing from the time you got here, if not earlier. It helps now. I'm not saying it don't help. When you sing that song, to put your mind in the right perspective with God. And, and the, the speaking of scriptures does the same thing. But let's remember on the night when Jesus Christ did this, all he did was ask for the blessings of both. He told them what they were, and then he asked for the blessings. It's important that we follow those patterns that God has given us. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 23, chapter 11, verse 23 through 26. And listen to how Paul said this. He said, For I received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood. This do ye as often as you drink. In remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. It's not just a prayer. It's a thank you note. 
When we pray to God and thank Him for the things He's done and thank Him for the, the blood, the bread which represents Jesus' body and the blood of, uh, fruit of the vine which represents His blood, we're saying thank you, God, for what you've done for us. Every prayer that we do should be a thank you, God. A thank you note sent to God. We thank Jesus for what He done. When we're thanking God, we're thanking Jesus too. Now let's remember that. There, we know that the, there's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and sometimes we refer to Him separately, but as a whole, they're God. Let's think about what He done. He redeemed us by blood. And that's what we're thanking Him for here. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 19, it says, Knowing this, that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. His body was incorruptible. It's incorruptible today. Well, it was corruptible when He was in a physical form. But His eternal self is not. So we're not redeemed by His physical form. We're redeemed by Him. Like silver or gold, for, for your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So He redeemed us. He redeemed us from the sin. In other words, He, he paid the debt that we owed so that we don't have to. Second of all, He saved us by grace. It's by grace that we were saved. That's God's part. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith. That's men's part. And, thou, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. But, I don't care what we do. If it was not for the grace of God, we would have no salvation. It's by the grace of God that Jesus Christ came. It's by the grace of God that this world still exists. It's by the grace of God we're here this We need to thank Jesus Christ because He forgave us for our sins. According to grace. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin according to His riches and grace. Jesus Christ came down from heaven. Do you realize what type of position He was in heaven? No pain. He suffered pain here. No suffering. He suffered, of course, here. He suffered hunger. He suffered thirst. That was never a thing in heaven. He had it. He had everything perfect. And he left that and come down here. He came down here to forgive us for our sins. And when he did that, he lifted us up. And I want you to think about something. All the people in the world are created equal. I know that. We're all created equal. There's no one better than other people. But we became a special people. Listen to how it's described. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A special people. And Jesus Christ's death on the cross was what raised us up to that position when we were baptized from the remission of sin. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 5 through 6, it says, To him who loves us, who loved us, and washed, a, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Raised up. Raised up. We are the chosen few. Chosen by God and we accept that chosen because we chose Him. We're all fortunate in the fact that God was willing to adopt us. We were not His chosen people, not to begin with. The, the, uh, the, the Jews were His chosen people. The only way we could be in with God was to be grafted in or, or adopted. Same thing. We're adopted as his own son. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 5 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of the son. Now we know and we understand that the Jews had to become members of the body too. 
They had to be baptized. They had to be come into the, the body of Christ. They couldn't continue as they were and still be God's chosen people. God's chosen people today is the church. And we need to be thankful for that. We need to always remember to thank God every single day of our life. We can't pray and thank God enough for what He's done for us. It's special. I believe it this morning with one more scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 through 29. Again, I think John had this in his reading. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall, guilt, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that is for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not concerning the Lord. People, we are unworthy. We don't deserve heaven. But Jesus Christ, God sent his son and Jesus Christ sacrificed his life so that we could be worthy. And But now, if you remember what it says here, it says, partaking in a worthy manner. It doesn't say that we have to be worthy. It says, but drinketh and eateth unworthily. In a bad way, in the wrong way. So if we can't remember Jesus, if we can't, if we've not come in contact with Jesus, and if we don't thank Jesus, then we're taking it in an unworthy manner. Let's pray that we always do it in a worthy manner and accept it way with God. If you're here with us this morning and you're not a member of the body of Christ, Today's the day to be a member of the body of Christ. There's no greater family in the world. There's no greater opportunity. There's no greater, greater anything in the world, organization anywhere, than the church itself. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Repent of your sins. Confess Jesus Christ before men and be baptized for the rest of your sins. And begin a life that is the greatest life that ever could be lived. The greatest adventure you could ever be involved in is being a member of the body of Christ. If somewhere along that line you stumble, if you're here today and you stumble, then you need to repent of ever what it is between you and God that, that is not right. Fix it. Repent of it. Ask God for forgiveness and you'll welcome you back. If you need our help, let us know while we all stand and while we sing.